Let's have a fling. Spin launch and other non-rocket based methods of reaching orbit. The first shown rocket in movie history was Frau and Mond in 1929 that had an actual vehicle assembly building and a set of tracks to the launch site that looks remarkably like Cape Kennedy. Things to come in 1936 envisioned a giant space gun, including a gun sight, I guess, to aim it to the moon, which would launch human gelatin with bone grit in it to the surface of the moon. They did know better than this, but they just thought it would be cool. In 1951, when Worlds Collide showed a giant rocket sled hurtling humanity's arc to a new planet where telemarketing could begin anew. In reality, rocket sleds have been part of the landscape as well as rockets. And the rocket sleds have reached some impressive velocities, almost 3,000 meters a second. So the plan for spin launch to put something in the atmosphere at 2,100 meters a second isn't fantasy. It can be done. NASA themselves plan to use a rocket sled into orbit using this maglev accelerator in an evacuated tunnel that would project it up a mountainside, but it didn't come to fruition. What did come to fruition was a gun that nearly launched something into orbit. By the Canadian engineer Gerald Bull, two old naval artillery cannons were welded together and reached 180 kilometers high using an 84 kilogram shell that had electronics that did survive 10,000 G. So it was proof of concept, but the funding was canceled. While the guns were nominally U.S. Navy 16-inch Iowa-class guns, the Martlet projectile fired by them was not that size. It was only seven inches in diameter, and this is something I don't think a lot of people appreciate. This required a sabot or shoe to encase the shell and fit it snugly into the barrel. And this is the picture of the sabot or sabot, if you don't like saying your French words correctly, encasing the martlet shell. So you got to be careful when you're thinking you could launch satellites into space. The original shell was too small and they never made a shell big enough to fit the barrel. So two cannons from an Iowa-class ship were put together and reached the edge of space. This thing, they're claiming, will be able to do the same thing at a minimum. Can they? I was unable to find trajectory data for the harp gun, so I recreated it from the public documents that were available, particularly the chemistry that gave me an idea of the magnitude of what they were able to achieve. So we need to take a quick look at the difference between rockets and guns because that harp gun is basically what spin launch is trying to improve upon but using a different launch technique. Here's data from a space shuttle flight that you can see at 240 seconds, about four minutes into flight, reached almost 100,000 meters and was now traveling as fast as that proverbial bullet. And this is the speed time graph of a rocket increasing in speed over time. Gradual start until you're going crazy fast, but you're way up in the air before that happens. A gun, on the other hand, does something very different. The harp gun's trajectory I recreated from the data would follow this path before it began to descend. It would reach 100,000 meters in altitude after about a minute and it would have lost half its speed. So guns lose speed rapidly as the projectile goes up. And in fact, the speed loss is extreme just after launch due to wind resistance. Rockets gain speed slowly, which is great for combating air resistance, which is maximum at lower altitudes. But you have to carry the weight of fuel with you. So as the space shuttle increased in speed, it's increasing in altitude. And by the time it reaches 100,000 meters, we're at what's called the Kármán line, effectively the point where there's no more wind resistance. So at 100,000 meters in altitude, that was four minutes into flight. Four minutes into that flight, the speed was reaching 2,000 meters a second. Okay, 
So prior to those four minutes, they were traveling much slower than a bullet. Well, at the four minute mark into flight, the air density has now dropped to effectively zero. So it pretty much means on the shuttle's acceleration journey, everything to the left of this arrow had some wind resistance associated with it. By the time you're to the right side of this arrow, there's no wind resistance at all. You could like open the front windshield of the shuttle, climb out and just sit there and be held in position by the rocket's acceleration, but there would be no drag force on you whatsoever. That is not the case for the harp gun. When the harp gun fired, there's a drastic loss in velocity, okay? By the time it reached 100,000 meters in altitude, the velocity is dropping precipitously. So at the one minute mark, the speed has fallen till it's just over 1,000 meters a second. So the point at which a friction-free ride comes along, they don't get as much time in the friction-free ride. This area is where the worst of the air resistance is. The speed is not coming down linearly. It's dropping really fast because of the formula that governs wind resistance. Beyond that point, the wind resistance is effectively zero and we can see it and that the speed time graph goes straight line. It means it's a constant acceleration. It's losing speed at approximately 10 meters a second every single second in flight. The advantage to rockets is the speed is very low when the air is thick and this reduces drag. But the rocket has to haul huge amounts of fuel with it. The gun, on the other hand, expends all the fuel on the launch pad, but it leaves at maximum velocity subjecting it to the greatest wind drag. So there's going to be an optimal solution. It won't be easy to find because there are so many variables involved in the design of a rocket or of a shell. So I'm going to have to make some estimations and some assumptions to make a reasonable projection at what can and can't be done with this method. The first thing we can look at is the energetics involved. According to the information, they were using a fuel with about 4.5 megajoules per kilogram, which is strikingly low, about 10 times less than gasoline. This would mean they gave an input energy of about 1,500 megajoules of gunpowder went into this cannon. But cannons and guns are notoriously inefficient. Most of the energy is burned off in other things. The presence of this giant jet of flame indicates a lot of the gunpowder was igniting after the shell was gone. If you see flame, it's wasted gunpowder. So they only actually got, from their stated muzzle velocity, they only achieved 185 megajoules of actual projectile motion, which is only 13%, which is really sucky for a cannon. It's much lower than you would normally expect, but guns are horrendously inefficient. You want it in uh, efficient projectile system, bow and arrow. Bows are the most efficient method ever invented, but they're not very powerful. Now, this is okay because Gerald Bull was going for maximum velocity for guns that were designed to hurl giant heavy things. The original gun would have been shooting a thousand kilogram shells at less than 800 meters a second. So he pushed these to their design limit to get the altitude. Now, the energy that went in of 185 megajoules should completely go from kinetic energy of launch speed to potential energy at height. And using a simplification in high school, we get that this thing should be traveling 225 kilometers into the air, according to basic high school conservation of energy. But it didn't. It didn't go anything like that height. So if we actually calculate the energy that did really truly appear from observations, the energy of height it reached only puts 147 megajoules achieved altitude. So 38 megajoules got lost along the way, and that's the air resistance. So it's pretty easy to get an empirical value for the air resistance from the data from that harp gun. Now, it's 38 megajoules a lot. Not, not terribly. It's only about two to three days of food supply for a human. But considering your budget was 185, losing 38, so it's pretty steep.
What we're going to be looking at is two battles, two equations, the Tsiolkovsky rocket equation and Stokes drag equation. These are the two determining the system. The delta V is how fast you want your rocket to go, about 7,000 meters a second if you want orbit. What's the advantage of spin launch? Spin launch reduces the delta V. When you fire, say, the harp gun, you start at 2,000 and you climb to 7,000. That's a significant reduction in your delta V. But Stokes' law taps you on the shoulder and says, what speed were you planning to start at in the Earth's atmosphere? I have some discussions with you about that. Unfortunately, if your starting speed is not zero, like a rocket, Stokes' law is going to come in and take some bite out of your sandwich. Let's look at the two together. First of all, we have no need to actually use the rocket equation with all the engineering detail. All I want to see is how it would change if we started at 2,000 meters a second and went to 7,000 versus going from zero to 7,000. So according to spin launch, they're going to be able to kick it in the pants at 2,000. When I take a ratio using the original value of 7,000 meters a second, cut it to 5,000 meters a second change, I get a ratio of 4. So according to Tsiolkovsky's equation, which is a simplification, I get 4 times less fuel to reach orbit if you start it out of a gun. And that's exactly what spin launch is claiming they can cut the fuel by a factor of four. So that seems promising, but they haven't discussed what this is going to do. It's planning to take a big wet bite out of your energy pants. So does it undo the savings from a sea level launch at high velocity? Let's look at this equation. The equation is easy to understand if frightening at first. It's all common sense. The wind resistance you face is going to be directly proportional to the area you turn into the wind. Bigger sail, bigger force of drag on the sail. Okay, not rocket science. Well, it is, but it's not like you think rocket science is. The shape of the projectile, or how pointy it is, is going to determine whether that area really catches the wind or not. Clearly, a blunt object in the wind is going to have a lot more time ramming through it than a pointed object. And you can look up these drag coefficients for every shape or calculate them. It's much easier than when I was in school. There's a reason the Japanese trains are called bullet trains. They've made the front pointy. Okay? Now, the projectile speed is going to drastically affect the drag. In fact, it's the most significant term because it's squared. If you double your speed and you square that number, you get four times the value. So trying to double your speed quadruples the wind resistance. You learned this as a child on a bicycle. The faster you pedaled, the wind seemed to be overly compensating it. Unfortunately, the speed changes one of the other numbers. The speed will impact the drag coefficient. The drag coefficient actually increases non-linearly up to Mach 1, meaning that for a while, it seems like you double your speed, you quadruple your drag, but then it starts growing insanely to the point you almost hit a wall at Mach 1. They called it the sound barrier for a reason. The drag coefficient climbs to three or four times higher than it was. So all of a sudden, just as you're approaching the sound barrier, the drag on your plane quadruples and in some cases tore them apart or the plane couldn't push through it. Once you push through it, the drag coefficient drops again. I can't deal with that. That's too much to program into my pathetic little computer, so I'm just going to use an average value. The last thing is, what are you ramming this object through? You're ramming it through air, water, syrup. You need to know the density. Well, the density changes as well. The higher the altitude we get, the air density plunges. So Stokes' law is actually fairly easy to understand. The drag you experience when running f through a fluid is what are you running through? How fast are you running through it? Are you pointy? And how big are you? I don't think that's terribly hard to understand. Of these variables, these three 
they're not fixed, but they're going to be predetermined, right? We're going to pick the shape of a rocket. We're going to pick the speed. We're going to fire it out of a gun. And we already know what the air density is going to be. What will be up to us to change is how wide we want to make this shell for spin launch. And that's where they're not saying, and that's where I have to make some assumptions of what would be a reasonably wide bullet to shoot a satellite in. And I cannot accommodate changes in the drag coefficient for a simple analysis like this. Someone would have to pay me. In recalculating the HARP dynamics, I got a data set I created that's based on the real data so I could have the flight projectile information along the way to compare with what happens with uh, spin launch and rockets. Now here's the trick. How big is the projectile going to be? Spin launch ain't saying. So let's take a look at the possibilities for it. This was the original Martlet shell, okay? As you can see, Unless this girl is Mary Poppins, there's no way that this satellite fits into that thing. And this satellite, pictured next to Elon Musk, I must warn you, Elon Musk's ego is not to scale in this picture. This satellite is typical of what we're supposed to be launching hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of in. And there's a big question mark on that. But if you look at the Starlink next to Elon Musk, it does look pretty much like it would fit in this rocket down here. And this is Rocket Lab's Electron Rocket, which is currently the smallest rocket in the world that can launch a satellite, and it's done it. It's done it many times now, so it's working. And they can carry a Starlink. So we're not going to be using Gerald Bull's Martlet. I mean, could we make a satellite fit in that? Yeah, most likely. But the question is, if a company's already got a hundred of these in their garage, are you really going to say to them, can you redesign them to fit into Mary Poppins' little artillery shell? Eh. So I'm going to use the Electron rocket as their closest competitor and go, can spin launch compete with this rocket system? And that gives me my engineering range. Now, these guys have been very cagey about the projectile dimensions. It looks like they're planning to go with uh, micro-satellite design, but like I said, if you already have existing satellites ready to go, uh, this is a problem. They actually state one dimension here, 76 kilonewtons of thrust, which kind of made me happy when I finally found this graphic. It took me a while that my calculations to scale down the electron gave me 75 kilonewtons. So that's kind of nice when you're doing a projection and then you find the actual data and go, oh, I was pretty close. I just didn't need to do it if I looked ahead of time for it. So here's where they're going to run into problems. How big of a shell are they going to shoot at a spin launch? It's really not up to them as much as they would think. The smallest they could go would be 18 centimeters, the same size as the heart projectile. But if they're going to go head to head with other businesses out there, they got to go a meter across. 1.2 meters is what the electron can carry. Because right now, that's what's out there. There are clients lined up for the electron rocket to launch satellites that fit in a 1.2 meter carapace. So uh, if you want to compete, this is what you have to compete against. You can't say, hey, would you like to come with us instead? You just need to redesign that satellite you already made. And, and I think that's something they're not really acknowledging. They're hoping people will build new satellites for them. So this is where we run into a problem. All these things are fixed in here. The half, the row, the V squared, the CD, that's not going to change. So that's all basically a constant that's taken care of by the calculations. It's really this area that we have to play with. And here's the problem. If you want to increase the diameter of the shell from about 20 centimeters to a meter, that's five times the diameter. That translates into 44 times the surface area of the original harp shell. This means they could be dealing with 44 times more drag if they try to construct the caliber necessary to directly compete with the electron rocket. And that's why I'm not so certain they are going to be able to make large shells. And that's what we're going to look at. Now, how 
big is this shell going to be lengthwise? It's got to be between 18 centimeters and one meter wide. How long is it going to be? Again, nobody's saying. The electron rocket is 18 meters long and they didn't give any other specs. So if this is a scale diagram, their payload is six meters long, that upper rocket and spin launch has to have that part. And the fuel section is nine meters long. Spin launch claims they can use one quarter of the fuel. So if I take one quarter of nine meters and add it to the six meters, I get about a nine meter long shell. So for their claim to be true, they're looking at some projectile about nine meters in length to uh, carry the fuel and the payload to get up to orbit. So they don't have a lot of choice on this unless they switch to exotic fuels or they go for a terribly narrow diameter. And if their diameter is narrow, their fuel section will get longer. So this is kind of the constraint they're dealing with unless they plan to make a brand new in, um, industry. So these are my, my basic suppositions that I need to do. And the other one that I need to do was a linear burn rate of fuel for 300 seconds. I had to synchronize the two rockets, so whether you're launching the electron by itself or the spin launch, both of them will burn their engines for 300 seconds, and this causes the burn rate when I cut to a quarter of the fuel supply. That's where I came up with my thrust for the spin launch rocket stage. And why did I make sure both go for 300 seconds? It's just the nature of the program I'm using. I need synchronized time clocks to plot the two against each other. So these are the suppositions I'll work with. The other thing we're going to only look at is a vertical launch. This works in spin launch's uh, advantage. The reason for a vertical launch is that puts us through the thinnest possible atmosphere. If we launch at 45 or 30 degrees, we start plowing through more and more air and that works against them. So in other words, if they can't launch vertically and do the same performance as the electron as a straight up shot, they're not going to match it on an angle because the wind resistance gets worse. And straight vertical shots are still done and used. The Canadian Black Brant sounding rocket can carry 200 kilograms all the way up to 1500 kilometers and it's half the weight of the electron rocket. And it has 71 kilonewtons of thrust. So there's stuff out there that can already do everything spin launch says it could do and they're extremely small and cheap and they don't use that much fuel to begin with. So if you're thinking they're going to compete with a Falcon rocket system, uh, 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 they're competing with these little baby rockets and the Canadian Black Brant rocket has been in use for decades. So the only thing it can't do is go into orbit. The electron is bigger and heavier because it's reaching orbital speed, which is a lot more than this thing does. Now, look at those rocket engines for the electron. Those little Rutherford engines are tiny, right? They're very, very tiny and they use a bunch of them. This is a really nice rocket system that has uh, incredibly quietly built a very tiny rocket system that's very modular and very small. And using that, um, I was able to work out roughly we're in the neighborhood of 3,600 to 4,000 kilograms when we're all done with the scaled down electron upper stage for the spin launch. And this is the kind of stuff I had to assume to begin with or I couldn't do any numbers. I would just get ranges. So this is how I kind of redesigned what spin launch would need to do to go head to head against the competition in the industry they hope to destroy. This is a small comparison between the spin launch and the harp gun. What I have here on the area is a multiplier to keep making the spin launch shell uh, larger in surface area. So as I double, triple, quadruple the surface area of the shell, you can see the range falling off compared to the harp gun. So at double the surface area of the shell, which is not doubling its diameter, range begins to drop off and this is the killer for the spin launch system at three times the surface area of the harp shell or the cross-sectional area the range begins to plummet
and the larger that shell becomes in diameter, the worse the performance gets. Now, obviously, the narrower the shell, the better. But the realistic problem is, the satellites don't come in narrow calibers as of yet. You can quickly see that caliber is everything. Increasing the size of the shell has a drastic effect on the range. We don't even get anywhere near one meter across and the range has dropped to the point it's useless. And this is their challenge. Even if I fire the shell at orbital speed now, it cannot compensate for the frictional losses. And this is going to be their undoing. They cannot fire big wide objects and satellites are big wide objects. We're going to look at another simulation for comparison here. What I've done is compared the rocket launch electron against a cannon and a cannon with the rocket in it to see the difference. So the competitor in the industry is the red line. That would be the result of the rocket launch in there. The rocket launch has a fair amount of drag for a rocket, it's my estimate. It's a one meter squared area and it has a mass of 12,000 kilograms and a thrust of about 240,000 newtons. It's actually 224. Slight mistake there. Okay, and I'm comparing it to a gun that has a much lower drag coefficient, closer to Gerald Bull's Martlet. It's the same size, it's only a short distance across, and it's a 4,000 kilogram launch. Now the mass won't really make much difference, and I'm not accounting for fuel loss right here. But at first blush, it looks like, wow, the um, gun works really well. The gun all by itself is the blue line. So the gun by itself and the rocket by itself doesn't seem to get much altitude. But when you put the rocket in the gun, it looks like, wow, this is phenomenal. But if we turn over here to our frictional losses, you can see the frictional losses are enormous on any gun-based launch, whether it's straight gun or a gun that turns on rocket engines at the same time. The friction losses are enormous and they're all concentrated in the first few seconds of flight as the shell goes screaming through the atmosphere. If we look at the cumulative loss, all right, both the gun and the gun that fires a rocket have huge frictional losses, but the rocket itself has none. But when you see this chart, your first reaction is to go, wow, spin launch is gonna outperform everyone. And it's like, nah. it's only doing so because we're using the parameters from Gerald Bull's gun. And if we try to fire anything nearly as big as the electron rocket, things change. So if I change the area of the gun, so the cross-sectional area of the shell is the same as the rocket launch. So spin launch will be going head to head against rocket launch. The advantages start to disappear. And the other silly little trick I've pulled here, we'll see in a moment, is we have have this ridiculous thrust. Well, there's no way spin launch is going to fire out something that has that kind of thrust. It has to be a lot less. So when I lower the thrust down to something more reasonable, and the system updates, what we see is the altitude has come down quite a bit. Now there's an enormous difference between the two anyway, okay? Huge difference. The gun on its own is pathetic. It's just gonna come back to Earth. But it looks like spin launch is pulling ahead of the rocket lab rockets big time. And when we look at the speed though, it just, looks the same because I've given them the same characteristics. Like I said, by downgrading the thrust to the smaller craft, 
you can actually see the accelerations are parallel. Just there's a visible little bit of air resistance here. So the frictional losses are enormous, whether you launch a gun or a rocket out of a gun. And it seems like the final altitude is very different, but the accelerations aren't very different at all. But I think a lot of people are under the impression that they're using harp gun data and going, but you're launching something that's only wide enough to carry a can of coffee versus something that's big enough to carry a Volkswagen sized container in it. So it really depends on what Spin Launch thinks its market is. But we're going to see in a moment the difference is even less than you think it would be. This simulation has a bit more detail to it and I'm including a fuel burn rate. The fuel burn rate is determined by the amount of time for 300 seconds. So I've set both to be burning for 300 seconds so they'll plot simultaneously next to each other. But I'm downgrading the size of what's being carried by the spin launch. The downgrading according to spin launch statistics would mean a 4,000 kilogram shell and so it would burn through its fuel much slower if it's going to last 300 seconds. So that's my simplification to allow me to use a spreadsheet for these these kind of values. Right now they're all extremely low friction and the rocket is full sized and I've kept the gun and the gun that shoots a rocket to a very small 18 centimeter projectile matching bull. And in this situation, it looks like the yellow line wins. The shooting a rocket out of a gun wins. But once again, we have this problem. What happens if we actually try to shoot something as big as an existing satellite? And again, they may want to go smaller, but they're not going to steal business from Rocket Lab doing that. The gun sucks even worse under these circumstances. The negative speed down here just means it's falling back to Earth. It's not an error. All of a sudden, though, the peak speed between the two craft is rapidly vanishing. So by the 300 second mark, there's not much of a difference anymore. Okay? And the altitude they reach, it's, it's really just a time uh, delay to, to getting to the two altitudes. What you're seeing is the rocket lab is catching up. So by the time spin launch begins to fire something out of the barrel that's approaching the size of an existing satellite, their advantage is rapidly vanishing. Now, what if we don't go so pointy? What if we put these things with a rounded head, oops, a round head, which would be more likely to accommodate the cylindrical profile of most satellites? If they can't fire a pointy shell out of the thing, they go for a real blunt design so you can fit in better cargo. Then the rocket begins to win. And this is a real problem unless they're planning to redesign the entire satellite fleet to fit their system. Spin launch could work as long as the caliber stays small. If the caliber stays small, you're not going to launch existing satellites. This final scenario allows me to investigate something else, delaying the second stage rockets. So instead of firing a rocket, comparing it to a gun and a rocket with a gun, we're going to compare Rocket Lab's electron to two scenarios for spin launch. One where we can delay the second stage engines kicking in and one where we can fire them at the outset. So this situation here, I have a 200 second time delay before the second stage engines kick in. Now it's, it's fairly artificial, but you see what's happening. It begins to peak at altitude and then suddenly it boosts, but it's not achieving anything like the final altitude of either the electron or the spin launch that's firing its engines immediately. The big difference is the maximum speed.
Spin Launch and Rocket Labs rocket get to both a very comparable peak speed, but if you delay the engine firing, you don't get much speed. This is Scenario 2 energy loss. This is Scenario 1 energy loss. All right, and here's the comparison of all three. The rocket still head and shoulders above the others in terms of wind resistance. What if I lower this? If I bring the time delay to 50 seconds, you're going to see that it does better. So your best bet is to fire those rockets the second she leaves the gun. And this makes sense because according to the laws of momentum, because there's more than just Tsiolkovsky's rocket equation, the laws of momentum say get rid of the mass as fast as you can. So kick on those engines right away. The additional friction isn't very much because you already left the barrel at 2,000 meters a second and you're only going to be traveling through atmosphere for a few seconds before wind resistance drops. So kicking on the engines immediately isn't going to cost you much in friction, but it is going to cost you a heck of a lot in total momentum as you're not shedding the mass. So you can see that your best bet is to burn off the fuel as quickly as you can. Unfortunately, what does it achieve? At the end of 300 seconds, all three scenarios are producing about the same Vmax. The altitudes are different, a reasonable difference uh, between the altitudes, but time will take care of that. And unfortunately, the frictional losses are such that um, it's, it's about 64 kilograms of kerosene, which by the time you add in the oxygen and all that, you're getting close to 300 kilograms extra needed to compensate for the, the frictional losses. But you still beat the other one. But we're talking here a few hundred dollars of fuel is it. So they're going to build that huge system to save a few hundred bucks on the launch. Now, obviously, if you are doing a single stage launch with one motor, the launch vehicle is going to be a lot simpler. You won't save any money on fuel, but you won't be launching a system with six to eight engines on it like Rocket Labs. But I'm not seeing the energy savings. The only way you're going to get those energy savings is if you fire a pointy shell. If you keep that shell narrow like Gerald Bull did, then yes, you will hands down beat the competitor. But again, who's going to agree to make their satellites five times narrower than they built in the first place? 